Salvete, and welcome back to Weekly Roman History. This is part 9, the Punic Wars. My sources are the same as in the previous few videos, McKay and Boatwright, and there are no content warnings for this video. We have left the legendary portions of history and are now on mostly factual ground. While some details are surely distorted or exaggerated and there are a few legends mixed in, from now on all our characters were real people who really did most or all of what I say they did. When we last left our story, the Romans had just proven themselves against their first foreign enemy, the Greek king and general Pyrrhus. As Pyrrhus left Italy for the last time, he is said to have remarked, what a fine battleground I leave for the Carthaginians, because it was so obvious to everyone in the ancient world that Rome and Carthage Carthage would soon be at war. Here in part 9, we will cover that inevitable conflict, the Punic Wars, which will change Rome's position in the world forever. As a review, Carthage is a city on the northern coast of Africa. It was founded by Phoenicians, a Middle Eastern people. The word Punicus in Latin means Phoenician, which is why the wars with Carthage are called the Punic Wars instead of the Carthaginian Wars or something. According to legend, Carthage was founded by Queen Dido, who fled Phoenicia and found a safe haven across the Mediterranean. According to Virgil, elaborating on that older legend, Dido had a brief affair with Aeneas, the last hero of Troy and ancestor of the Roman people. In Virgil, with Dido's last breath, she vows that her people will forever hate the descendants of Aeneas. This is Virgil writing centuries after the Punic Wars to justify them. In actual fact, we have evidence of some limited cooperation between Rome and Carthage as allies in the century before the war broke out. The tension between Rome and Carthage builds after the war with Pyrrhus, in which Rome captured Magna Graecia, the southern coast of Italy, from Greece. Rome is an agricultural power who mistrusts international trade. Carthage is a maritime power. They make their money through international trading, which means they are masters of coastal cities and islands, including some important holdings in Sicily, the island just off the toe of Italy. Carthage wants to conquer Messana, a Greek city on the eastern coast of Sicily that controls the strait between Sicily and Italy. They start to do just that during the Romans' war with Pyrrhus, which is why Pyrrhus leaves Italy for Sicily for a while. After Pyrrhus runs back to Greece, Messana and the other Greeks on Sicily ask for Rome's help against Carthage. Rome jumps into the war, claiming to be afraid that if Carthage takes Messana, they'll cross over and try to conquer parts of Italy next. Which is pretty thin reasoning. The Romans really just want Messana themselves. The This kicks off the First Punic War in 264 BCE. As we know, Rome's military strength lies in large armies that it can refresh with new soldiers at will, thanks to its large numbers of Italian allies. Carthage is a maritime power, with coastal holdings and comparatively little agricultural territory. They don't control nearly the population Rome does, so though they have the best naval fleet in the ancient world, they have to rely on mercenaries to supplement their regular soldiers. But because Sicily is an island, Rome can't take it without challenging Carthage on Carthage's strength, on the water. Rome hastily builds a fleet by copying Carthage's designs. The Romans have only been warring in Italy. They haven't needed warships before. Now, ancient warships had sails like trading ships, but they needed to be more maneuverable, so they had banks of oars manned by hundreds of sailors and or slaves. The ships are named after how many banks of oars they have. A bireme has two, a trireme has three, etc. Ships also had a big bronze ram sticking out of the front. It was called a rostrum in Latin, which means beak. Naval battles were fought by attempting to ram enemy ships. The rostrum was designed to punch holes in the wooden sides of ships. As a side note, the speaker's platform in the Roman Forum was called the rostrum because it was decorated with a bunch of ships' prows taken in a battle with the Latins a century earlier, which is why a speaker's platform today is often called a rostrum. Anyway, fighting with rostra is really hard, and the Romans are having to try to learn it fast. They show their ingenuity with an invention called the corvus, which is Latin for crow or raven. The corvus is a simple device. It's a gangplank, just a long plank of wood with spikes on one side. The Romans load regular soldiers onto a boat, get next to a Carthaginian boat, throw the corvus over so that the spikes stick in, then board the boat and fight the people on board. Thus, the Romans effectively turn naval battles into land battles and regain the upper hand by playing to their strengths. Even the name is cheeky. The rostrum of traditional naval warfare refers to part of a bird, the beak, and the corvus is the whole bird. Crows and ravens were associated with a tricky sort of intelligence in Roman culture, much as we think of foxes today. The corvus isn't used for long. The Carthaginians figure them out and adapt, but it bridges a gap while the Romans develop better naval technique. 
The Romans win some early battles, most notably Milae in 260 BCE, but none of them are decisive, and the war settles into a long stalemate. Then, in 256 BCE, a Roman consul named Marcus Attilius Regulus takes the fight to Africa. He wins a battle, takes the city of Tunis, and causes a Carthaginian ally called the Numidians to rebel, but he can't win the war before campaign season ends. He can't afford to keep the whole army in Africa over the winter, so he sends half back to Italy. In 255, he gets the half of his army that stayed with him destroyed by a Spartan mercenary general named Xantippus. In the legendary accounts, Carthage sends Regulus back to Rome to negotiate. Regulus promises he will return if he's unsuccessful. Carthage assumes he will argue forcefully for a prisoner exchange, because he himself would be part of that prisoner exchange. But he doesn't. Regulus tells the Senate, truthfully, that Rome can afford the loss of men, and Carthage can't. So Rome should refuse the prisoner exchange. They do, and Regulus returns to Carthage, as promised, and is tortured to death. This is one of those probably too good to be true stories of Roman virtue. They tell you more about Roman aspirations than facts. Rome loses fleet after fleet and lots of soldiers, but in the Roman way, they just keep building more boats and filling them with new recruits. Meanwhile, Carthage tries unsuccessfully to conquer more land in the interior of Africa so they can have a source of troops like Rome's. They're also having to fight their former ally Numidia, which was flipped by Regulus. Eventually, Carthage is stretched too thin, and Rome takes Sicily. In 241 BCE, Carthage makes a peace where they give up Sicily and pay Rome a lot of money. Sicily becomes Rome's first province, the first piece of territory outside Italy that they keep a permanent presence in. But there's an epilogue to the First Punic War. After the war, Carthage can't make good on its promises to its mercenaries, and the mercenaries rebel. Rome jumps in again on behalf of the mercenaries on the island of Sardinia, and redeclares war on Carthage. Of course, there's no way Carthage can fight, they just surrendered, so they're forced to undergo another peace negotiation, in which they give up Sardinia and Corsica to Rome, and pay even more money. This is a transparently greedy move by Rome. They had no business getting involved in the conflict with the mercenaries. They saw an opportunity to squeeze more land and money out of Carthage, and they took it. Carthage is very much embittered by this. Virgil has the hatred between Rome and Carthage begin with Dido at Carthage's very foundation, but in fact, this incident is probably the origin of that hatred. You might have noticed that part of Regulus's army stayed in Africa during the winter, which is a major change that is gradually occurring at this time. Where before, armies deployed for only the campaign season, spring and summer, and went home for the fall harvest and winter, now some soldiers are being kept on duty all year. This means that these soldiers, by definition, are not self-supporting. They need to be fed and paid to make up for the farming they can't do, which means Rome has to greatly increase taxation. For this reason, standard coinage becomes a thing in this era. Okay, so at the end of the First Punic War, everyone knows there's going to be a second one. Carthage now hates Rome and wants to regain its Mediterranean supremacy, and Rome always wants more influence. Between the First and Second Punic Wars, Carthage dedicates itself to conquering land in Spain, both to gain more Mediterranean land and to add more potential soldiers. Carthage wants to rival those inexhaustible Roman troop reserves. The leading general of Carthage's efforts in Spain is a general named Hamilcar Barca, who was also a general in the First Punic War. With Hamilcar is his nine-year-old son Hannibal, who will soon become Rome's number one enemy. According to Roman legend, Hamilcar had Hannibal swear an oath of eternal hatred toward Rome when he was very young. That's unlikely, but it's certain that Hannibal would have been raised resenting the treatment of Carthage by Rome in the First Punic War. Hamilcar dies in Spain and is succeeded by his son-in-law, Hasdrubal. Then Hasdrubal dies, and Hannibal takes on his father's command. Rome has been watching all this nervously, especially when young hotshot Hannibal takes over. They claim that Carthage has violated a treaty with their movements in Spain, even though all the historians seem to agree that they didn't, and declares the Second Punic War in 218 BCE. I'm pushing an elephant up the stairs. I'm Rome sends out two armies, one led by Publius Cornelius Scipio toward Spain, and another led by Tiberius Sempronius Longus to Sicily, to head for Carthage itself. Hannibal is sure that the only way to challenge Rome is to hit them in Italy. Their strength is their Italian manpower, so his idea is to weaken their Italian allies by destroying them or getting them to defect. 
To get to Italy without encountering Roman resistance, he does something crazy and crosses the Alps in 218 BCE. The Alps are an absolutely enormous mountain chain, nothing you want to cross with huge amounts of people. Their why Switzerland has long been considered safe from invasion. But Hannibal sets out over them with 50,000 foot soldiers, 9,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants. Legend has it that he even uses vinegar to dissolve rocks when they are too high to pass, though that's probably nonsense. It takes him two weeks to cross, and he encounters local resistance. Between the tough conditions and the skirmishes, he loses half his forces. But when he emerges on the other side, which is undefended because the Romans sent their armies to more logical places for a fight, he quickly makes alliances with the northern Italian Gauls to make up for his losses. Rome scrambles the army led by Longus, recalling them from Sicily to meet Hannibal in northern Italy. Hannibal destroys them. In the aftermath, he releases all the non-Roman prisoners. He's showing favor to Rome's Italian allies, hoping to get them to defect. It's his strategy for depriving Rome of their troops. It's a risk, because his own ability to get reinforcements is very limited, and Rome is working to limit it further. In 217 BCE, Hannibal wins an enormous victory in the Battle of Lake Trasimene. 15,000 Romans and Italian allies are killed, including the consul Gaius Flaminius, who is commanding the army. 10,000 are taken prisoner, and as before, Hannibal releases the non-Romans. Hannibal's threat is growing larger, and Rome appoints a dictator, which it hasn't done in about 30 years. This is Quintus Fabius Maximus, who embarks on an unorthodox strategy. He avoids any direct battles with Hannibal, instead leading him on a chase throughout the Italian countryside and hitting him with tiny skirmishes that prevent his men from foraging for food or supplies. He always retreats before anything major can happen. Fabius knows that Hannibal will have difficulties getting supplies or reinforcements from Carthage, so he's denying him supplies through plunder and providing a slow, steady drain on his men. The strategy works as planned, weakening Hannibal's army and keeping Italian towns from defecting to him. But it's extremely unpopular back in Rome. The Senate and people want victories. Hannibal has had lots of glorious victories against Rome, and Rome desperately wants to pay him back. Fabius' tactics earn him the derogatory nickname Cunctator, or Delayer. The strategy of avoiding battle and trying to exhaust the enemy comes to be called Fabian tactics. George Washington famously used Fabian tactics against the British, and had the same pressures to bring home real victories applied by his own Congress. Fabius arguably saves Rome from losing the war, but when his six months as dictator are up, Rome is happy to send a consul with the largest army Rome has ever assembled to challenge Hannibal to a real battle. This is the Battle of Cannae of 216 BCE, which goes down in history as the biggest Roman military disaster. Even though the Carthaginian army is much smaller, Hannibal is such a better general that he outmaneuvers the Romans. About 50,000 Romans and Italians die, including a current consul, an ex-consul, and 80 senators. Hannibal collects the gold rings from the dead aristocrats and has them poured out on the floor of the Carthaginian Senate to illustrate the extent of his victory. It is a devastating loss for Rome. There isn't a family in the city that doesn't lose someone. It literally changes the demographics of the city and the Senate for a generation. The Romans switch back to Fabian tactics, the city goes into mourning, and pulls out all the stops to seek the favor of the gods. Rituals, games, including the Ludi Apollinares, which become annual, they even import an eastern goddess they call the Magna Mater from Asia Minor to Rome after the Oracle of Delphi tells them to. They need to raise more armies, and with so many dead, they resort to freeing criminals, debtors, and slaves. Even so, they reject offers from Hannibal for prisoner exchanges. As desperate as they are for soldiers, they know Hannibal needs them even more. A number of Rome's Italian allies switch sides, especially in the south. The Samnites, much of Campania, and many of the Greeks of Magna Graecia in Sicily. But it isn't enough. Hannibal was counting on pulling away Italian allies in huge numbers, and most of them are staying loyal to Rome. Hannibal's numbers are dwindling, and Rome is holding fast. Rome knows that the strength of their numbers is, as always, their biggest advantage. They start a side war in Macedon just to make sure Hannibal's ally Philip V can't provide him any troops. By 211 BCE, it is obvious that the tide has turned. Rome hasn't won any battles, but Hannibal is gradually losing the war. Meanwhile in Spain, Publius Cornelius Scipio and his brother Gnaeus have been waging their own war, gaining land and allies, and denying Hannibal reinforcements from that region. Both die in battle in 211 BCE, and to replace them, Rome votes to send another Publius Cornelius Scipio, the son of the first one. 
He's only 25, and Rome can't spare any officers with Imperium, so he is not elected any kind of magistrate. He is sent to Spain as Privatus cum Imperio, a private citizen with Imperium. He's just some guy. It's an unprecedented move for unprecedented times. Under the new Scipio, all of Carthaginian Spain is under Roman control by 206 BCE. Scipio is made consul for 205 BCE, and despite a number of official objections, he ignores the weakened Hannibal in Italy and leads an army to North Africa to challenge Carthage directly. He wins some battles there and gains the support of the Numidian king Massinissa. The Carthaginian senate summons Hannibal to come back and defend the homeland, and Hannibal obeys, even though it means leaving his army in Italy. In 202 BCE, Hannibal, leading a different Carthaginian army, meets Scipio at the Battle of Zama, which is erroneously named and didn't actually happen at Zama. Scipio hands Hannibal his first ever defeat and effectively ends the war. Scipio gets the agnum and Africanus for conquering Africa. There's a famous story that is almost definitely not true, but I'm going to tell you anyway. After the war, Hannibal goes into a self-imposed exile and winds up as a military advisor for other regions. Scipio Africanus, who defeated him, is of course an influential Roman politician, traveling the world on military and diplomatic missions. Hannibal and Scipio both happen to wind up in the same city in the east and have a drink together, swap old war stories. Scipio asks Hannibal who he thinks is the greatest general of all time, and Hannibal gives the only answer anyone at this time would, Alexander the Great. I told you, all the ancient war boys want to be Alexander the Great. Scipio asks who's second, and Hannibal says Pyrrhus. This is a bit of a dig at Rome since Pyrrhus was their enemy, but Scipio presses on. Who's the third best general ever? Hannibal admits that he would rank himself third. Scipio smirks and says, ah, but I beat you. Shouldn't I be ranked above you? Hannibal says, maybe, maybe. But if I'd beaten you, I'd be above Alexander. Sidebar on the great man theory of history. I've been wanting to get this in somewhere, and I think this story is an excellent opportunity. In past studies of history, all the way from ancient historians to about the 20th century, it was assumed that great men made history. To study the past, you studied the influential people who created historical events. And these were called great men because, in the opinions of the historians I'm referring to, only men need a plot. Modern historians take a very different view of history, and I can use the Second Punic War to show you how this works. Because, of course, Hannibal is right. He was a better general than Scipio. He was better than every single general Rome threw against him. If great men make history, it stands to reason that the better general should have won the war. But individuals don't drive history. What won the war for Rome was not the actions of individual generals, but huge trends that individuals could never have hoped to influence. The seeds of Rome's victory over Carthage were sown by the favorable treaties they made with their first Italian allies centuries earlier. They had no idea at that time that these treaties would turn the rest of Italy into an unstoppable troop reserve. If Scipio hadn't been the consul in 205 BCE, some particularities of the war might have been different, but the result is unlikely to have changed. The so-called great men of history are in the right place and the right time to take advantage of larger trends. They don't create them. If the exact same Hannibal had been born in Carthage a hundred years earlier or a hundred years later, he would not have led the same war against Rome. The war was a product of its time, not its generals. Individual leaders can change things for better or worse if they're particularly good at their jobs or particularly cruel and horrible, but studying their personalities will never grant us true understanding of history. The Prussian statesman Otto von Bismarck came closer to the truth when he said, the leader's task is to hear God's footsteps marching through history and try to catch on to his coattails as he marches past. Carthage makes its peace treaty in 201 BCE. They have to surrender their fleet, make enormous payments over the course of 50 years, and give up all of their territory except for a small area around the city. And most importantly, they are not allowed to wage any kind of war without Rome's permission. The terms are designed to cripple Carthage going forward. The war has devastated Rome and its Italian allies, but the result is an incredibly enhanced dominance over the Mediterranean. This dominance will become a blessing and a curse, which I'll go into next week. 
Right now, we need to end the Carthage story. Carthage is beholden to Rome for the next 50 years as they make their payments. They actually regain their economic prosperity, even with the restrictions imposed on them, and try to pay Rome early. But Rome refuses. They want Carthage to stay in their debt. But the prohibition on military action chafes. Rome's Numidian ally Massinissa, whose kingdom borders Carthage, starts to encroach on Carthaginian land. Rome sides with its ally when Carthage complains, allowing Massinissa to become more and more brazen. Meanwhile, the anti-Carthage sentiment in Rome runs deep. They're still mad about Hannibal, and now that Carthage has recovered economically, there's money to be made by destroying it. Ah, finally, the primary source quote. This one's a classic. Cartago de Lenda est. There's a Roman senator named Marcus Porcius Cato. We call him Cato the Elder. He's a real character. I'll tell you more about him next week. During this time, he is in the habit of ending every speech he gives, no matter the subject, with Cartago de Lenda est. Carthage must be destroyed. Nice guy. This is actually a paraphrase, but it's more famous than any of the various indirect versions given by our literary sources. And certainly it'll show you the anti-Carthage sentiment. Cato might have been speaking about land reform or the grain supply, and still used the opportunity to advocate for a genocide. So in this tense climate, Carthage uses force to push back against Massinissa, and Rome declares that they violated their treaty and declare the Third Punic War in 149 BCE. Carthage tries to surrender immediately, but the Romans demand that they abandon their city and settle somewhere else at least 10 miles from the coast, an obviously unacceptable demand. Rome thinks the war will be quick and easy, but Carthage settles in for a siege, and it's very well equipped for it. It takes three years to finally breach the walls. It's Scipio Aemilianus, grandson through adoption of Scipio Africanus, who does it. He is elected consul even though he is too young and hasn't gone through the Cursus Honorum, because the Romans think another Scipio will bring them another victory. They're proven right. In 146 BCE, Scipio burns Carthage to the ground, which takes 10 days, and enslaves or kills every last citizen. There's a pervasive myth that the Romans salted the earth so that nothing could ever grow in Carthage again, but that's not true. We can't even blame that rumor on Roman historians, since it seems to have been invented in the 1800s CE. Quite to the contrary, the former site of Carthage wound up as farmland. In the same year, 146 BCE, a different Roman commander destroys Corinth, one of the richest cities of Greece, in much the same way as Scipio Aemilianus destroys Carthage. Rome's former habit of leaving local government in place and only demanding loyalty in war is giving way to a much more destructive form of conquest, and it is ranging farther and farther out from Italy. Rome's relationship with the world is changing. Rome is building an empire. But simultaneous wars in Carthage, Greece, and Spain strain the Roman armies. Their strength so far has been their bottomless troop supply, but it is clear that their recruitment techniques will not be sufficient to run an empire. Rome desired dominance over the Mediterranean, but the creation of an overseas empire will cause changes that will destabilize the balance of power in Rome. Next week, the wheels start to come off.